and welcome to today's book release function. Someone at Business Transformation Academy said, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it transforms. A very good evening to all of you gathered here on this auspicious day of the release of the book entitled Why Digital Transformations Fail, authored by Tony Saldana. I believe that this is a very pertinent topic because digitization is not a choice today, it is the need of the hour or you have missed the bus. On behalf of the author, Mr. Tony Saldana, publishers Berit Kohler and Penguin Random House and the kind benevolence of the Department of Art and Culture and Goa Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I, Dr. Flori Pereira, extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, we have amongst us a galaxy of dignitaries. May I request the author, Mr. Tony Saldana, to escort the chief guest, Mr. Michael Lobo, Honorable Minister for Ports, DRDA, Science and Technology and Waste Management, Government of Goa to the days, and the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Goa University, Professor Varun Sani, <coughs> the respected Chairman and Managing Director of Goa Shipyard Limited, Komodo B.B. Nagpal, and respected Director, Digital Learning and Initiatives, Associate Professor at Goa Business School, Sri Ram Rao Surya Vah. Can you please accompany them to the days? We have the principal of PES College, Dr. Vikas Pisulikar. We have some management members from Goa Shipyard. We have Professor Savita Kerkar, Dr. Joe D'Souza, uh, scientist from NIO, Professor Saram, <coughs> Dr. Janardhanam, many faculty members from Goa University, Dr. Achutan Kutti, Man Shanta Achutan Kutti. I mean, there are so many, I, I could go on whole evening. I welcome all of you. <laughs> to kindly welcome Director General of GCCI. Uh, he's sitting right on the back. He's a best-selling author, board advisor, and Fortune 100 company consultant with deep operational global business services, as well as information technology experience. Tony has over three decades of international business expertise in the US, Europe, and Asia. He was named on Computers Premier's 100 IIT Professionals list in the year 2013. Tony brings a proven record of GBS design and operations, CIO positions, acquisitions, divestitures, outsourcing, disruption innovation, and experiences in creating new business models during a 27-year career in Procter & Gamble. After having run a two and a half billion global IT and shared service organization in every region of the world, Tony took on the challenge of disrupting this already best-in-the-class operation. He undertook the task of disrupting the global IT and shared services industry itself, given PNG's leadership position in the area. He did this by bringing together peer Fortune 50 companies the top global IT companies and venture capitalists to deliver this effort. As regards board experiences, they include advisory loans at WorkFusion, Win, Grasshopper, the shared services and outsourcing network, intelligent automation and AI network, IT advisory board membership at the University of Cincinnati, at the Indiana University Business Intelligence Program, and at the University of Texas. He has been on the customer advisory boards of Cloudera, Box and High Radius, and venture capitalist organizations like Secure and Bolstark. Besides the non-profit include, he was the founding member and the chairman of the board of Inter Alliance of Greater Cincinnati, and is currently on the board of Community Shares of Greater Cincinnati, 
and remineralize the earth. Most recently, Tony has started Transformant, a company that consults with 20 of the Fortune 100 companies, public sector companies, and small and medium enterprises on digital strategy. He is a sought-after global speaker and now a best-selling author. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Goa's accomplished son, Tony Saldan. Chief guest of today's function, Sri Michael Lobo, Honorable Minister for Science and Technology, Ports, DRDA, Government of Goa, Respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Varun Sani, Distinguished Guest, Chairman and MD of Goa Shipyard Limited, Commodore B.B. Nagpal, My friend and author of the book, Why Digital Transformations Fail. Mr. Tony Saldana, all the other distinguished personalities in the audience and dear friends. It gives me really great pleasure and a sense of pride to be a part of this function. Though I am supposed to review this book, I think first I should uh, have some words about my association with Tony. Uh, I. My association with Tony is almost uh, two years old through his sister, Dr. Flory, who has shouldered the responsibility of organizing this event so graciously and also gave us an opportunity to be part of this event. We came to know Tony not through his adventures in business, transformation and all that. Actually, uh, we came in touch with each other because of the musical talents of his daughter, Lara, when we organized the piano recital at Kala Academy two years back. And uh, at that time, even at that time, I was not aware that Tony is actually working in a, in a technology environment. But recently when uh, Flory and uh, Anthony and myself, we are discussing about Tony's visit and uh, release of the book, at that time I came to know the role Tony played or the leading role he played in transforming and especially digitally transforming one of the world's biggest consumer services enterprise of PNG. Unknowingly, I think many of us are customers of PNG and we might have been impacted by Tony's work. We are not aware of that. When I went through the book and uh, just before this book release, uh, one month back, I think we also had a guest lecture at university which Tony delivered on how to be a hero using digital transformation. What we realize is Tony is a great asset for Goa and we have to utilize his rich experience for his homeland. And I think our true Goikar, Bab Tony, will oblige. We realize when, we, uh, when, we, when he delivered his talk, the immense potential he has for the academy, for the business, and even for the government setup in Goa. Since he had this wish to release his book in Goa, and we are really happy with that. In fact, he had, I think, multiple releases, and uh, still there are some more international releases scheduled all over the world. We are we could, since we suggested that we'll have a tie-up with like-minded organizations and that's how I think Goa Chamber of Commerce, Department of Science and Technology and eventually even Director of Art and Culture also roped in. And uh, we are really happy that we are having this event today. On the day of his talk at Goa University, he presented me with a copy of this book and uh, I immediately started reading that book. At that time, I was not having any idea that I have to talk about the book. And I had already spoken about this book at multiple uh, occasions or with my friends, but not at a public uh, uh, forum like say this. When I started reviewing this book and uh, I was planning my talk, I my mind went back to a very interesting <coughs> article which I had read and which I use as an example of a case study while teaching at management schools. 
and that's a, a, a very interesting and controversial article by Nicholas Carr. I think Tony might be aware of him. I think later on he became editor of Harvard Business Review magazine. So the, the title of the article written by Nicholas Carr in 2003, May 2003 was It Doesn't Matter. It actually is IT, Information Technology. And this became one of the most controversial and most popular article about use of IT in business. And it, it generated a lot of debate and the subsequent issues of HBR also had a lot of views supporting and countering his ideas. And uh, basically what I think he proposed was at that time in 2003, IT was become so popular. He said that we have to think of IT as a commodity and not as something which is a competitive advantage. And he gave a lot of examples about railroads and other things which rather than having proprietary, we are sharing, same way IT has to be shared. Now actually, my, I'm not talking about that book as such, but 10 years later in 2013, still this article was popular and I think it's used as one of the starting or opening uh, case in most of the uh, management schools. So another author, he wrote, he had a write-up, in the, in, the, in the website about why or how this type of controversial articles become popular or how to actually in other words how to make something more popular and then uh, he listed some ten, uh, six lessons I will just talk about those lessons not all are applicable to Tony's but still Tony's book I think will be popular one lesson number one use a provocative and controversial title. So if you see the title of Tony's book also, like just like he says, it doesn't matter or IT doesn't matter. Same way here we see digital, why digital transformations fail. And it, it creates some sort of a anxiety, but I think his subtitle assures you that he has a way to solve these problems. Lesson number two was, Tell a good story with a complete, well thought out argument in sober terms and no jargon. This is also applicable to Tony's book. He has written out this book, although it is divided to multiple chapters, different concepts, but still it, it you, you could read it like a storybook. It always, every chapter opens with some nice anecdote or a story or an incident. And then he takes you through various uh, issues where he mentions a lot of technical terms but still they are all explained or, or, or they are in a very uh, uh, understanding form. Lesson number three, while sounding controversial, make sure you echo a very mainstream idea and attitude. Lesson number four, make sure you use convincing historical analogies, even if they have nothing to do with the topic of discussion. So in this case, Tony gives a lot of historical analogies, but all of them are relevant. If, if, uh, if those who have read this article, it doesn't matter. He uses a lot of historical analogies like horse cart and all, and then there are authors who have said that, no, these are not relevant in this uh, 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 context. Lesson number five, ignore examples don't, that don't fit your argument. Actually don't even bother with any example to support your argument. But here I think Tony gives a lot of examples to support each and every statement he makes. In fact at the end in one of the last chapter he has given <coughs> hundreds of uh, incidents that will become reality like using AI, deep learning and all these technologies. And he has, he has used several examples related to the business context and use of information technology throughout the book. Lesson number six, make sure your topic is a fuzzy term which could be redefined in the future. But I think in this case, Tony has a very good topic. It's not fuzzy. He has clearly defined it and he has explained how to take off as well as how to stay ahead in the race 
in digital transformations. This book really demystifies a lot of jargon associated with technology and shows how to effectively use this is one of the important uh, term exponential technology to create exponential organization using digital transformation in a very lucid jargon free way that could be understood by anybody as uh, anthony mentioned the book is specifically about how he led the digital transformation effort at png Many of these exponential technologies, in fact, we are also discussing that some time back, are ready and some are evolving and have been put to use separately. And as I said, he has given examples of all this. But very few books describe how, how all this can be applied to digitally transform a large multinational corporation successfully. So the real problem was many of the books which related to exponential technology are related to design of products or startups and so on but something as complex as Procter & Gamble which present which is present somewhere, I think in more than 108 countries how to manage the transformation is a very complicated issue and he has explained it using these technological terms in fact he explains the five stage transformational model and I think maybe Tony will be able to better explain it later which was followed by his, uh, his group. As he says, and as the data also uh, uh, proves that more than 70% of such digital transformations initiatives fail. And even when I teach software engineering, we always start with a very sorry uh, state of affairs saying that it was earlier, I think only 18% of projects could succeed and in Overall, it could be around say 30 as mentioned in the book also, but 70% projects fail. In the title, this book, uh, in the title of this book, these words, the surprising disciplines of how to take off and stay ahead, these are also important. And in fact, this use of analogy, where he makes use of aeroplane analogy, design and take off of aeroplane is important now to uh, achieve this transformation he uh, as the subtitle mentioned the surprising disciplines in fact he has mentioned 10 disciplines and he uses or he terms them as surprising but I think there is nothing surprising about them but only thing is we don't realize that yes, they can be used. They are all part of systems thinking, organizational behavior, human psychology. But the trick is in organizing them into series of five stage models. So this 10 surprising disciplines have been organized into a stepwise process where the first stage starts with foundation, the second stage starts with siloed. The third stage starts with partially synchronized, then fully synchronized and the last one which is all these first four stages are related to the to the, the to the takeoff in analogy with the aeroplane and then staying ahead. That is where leaving DNA this particular uh, stage comes into picture. And all throughout he has provided a rich set of references pointing to books and articles some of which I'll mention because they are also must read just like this book but one of the important thing he uses and which actually makes this book also interesting is it's not about only technology but how to use all these other common sense techniques which have been used and one of the most common sense technique is using checklists so all these disciplines which he has mentioned for which he has developed a checklist and which is there at the end of the book. Anybody who actually comes up with a startup or having a business can use this checklist to achieve all these disciplines. And I was very happy uh, to note the use of checklist. And I recollect reading and going through a book by Dr. Atul Gawande. And I think he has also mentioned it. So when I started reading his book, 
I was wondering why he has not mentioned Atul Gawande anywhere, but later on, immediately in the first few pages, I found another uh, uh, Indian origin uh, medical practitioner who works in US. He has written this excellent book called Checklist Manifesto, which actually explains how checklists can be effectively used. In fact, they have been used effectively in airline industry, and Atul Gawande developed a technique to use that into medical field. To, to eliminate the errors during surgery and so on. And here, Tony is actually using it for the business transformations. Another important uh, influence I think Tony had in this book and which I think we should also try to find more about from uh, uh, is about the works of people at Singularity University. And I think most of the work which Tony and his team has done is based on the ideas developed by Singularity University which he mentions extensively and in particular the work of Salim Ismail who is the authority on exponential organizations and I think readers also over here who may have come uh, uh, to know this term for the first time could also look at the work by Salim Ismail which is on the website of Singularity University or his books on exponential organizations. One of the important thing which struck me was the role of top leadership in achieving such transformations and it's a very very interesting uh, uh, case studies related to Singapore, which is mentioned in the book, which has established Singapore as the first, it is, it is having the first rank on digital readiness index. And uh, incidentally, India is 91st on this rank and USA is 5th on this rank. So I was, when I, I started reading that, I was thinking about our state, if not India, why can, why can't we be on par with the facilities and the, the type of infrastructure and type of the services which are provided in Singapore and probably Tony could help us in achieving that also. So I think this this is a must read for all of you and uh, the, the type of maturity and the, the leadership which is shown by Prime Minister of Singapore is highlighted over there. Prime Minister of Singapore was actually a computer scientist and in fact I was really happy to see that he even wrote a piece of C++ code and he has put it on Facebook to prove that he is really a programmer. So this is very interesting uh, 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 things to read from his book. And uh, same way when he spoke about uh, top leadership, when he actually uh, uh, started leading this transformation, digital transformation, his company, he incidentally worked along with his uh, team without having his own exclusive cabin, he used to sit with workers and that's also a really important thing to do. Some other interesting things like some of the emails which used to get from the assistant of his other counterparts in other companies regarding scheduling and other things are not actually emanating from human beings but from the robots which are working as admins or the assistants and that is how he also realized that there is a lot of power in all these technologies. <laughs> Another interesting uh, uh, story is about transformation of newspaper, Washington Post after founder of Amazon Jeff Bezos took it over and how he made it turned into tax savvy organizations. As a thought leader, Tony thinks that the following are the exponential five technologies that will impact our life and business. We were just talking about some of them some time back. Artificial intelligence and deep learning, smart process automation, a big field, blockchain, robotics and drones, and special functions technology like IoT, 3D printing, and so on. And I think he has talked about all of these. Another very interesting approach which is taken by these top-notch organizations was 
we usually expect that whatever project we start will succeed but i think they have realized that some of them eventually fail and they have to fail so this striking approach of 10 5 4 1 you will be able to read that in the book where out of 10 projects taken for transformations five are discarded at some stage four will give 2x or two times or four times the value and out of those 10 only one of them will give 10 10 times value and that is very interesting and maybe after some years some of those projects which were discarded can actually tend a value so when i look as i mentioned in the uh, some time back regarding singapore's case again what is the worth of this book for goa i think goan students faculty entrepreneurs as well as corporates and government decision makers should read this book to understand how to handle the digital transformation if you see most of our government websites are in dismal state, it is unresponsive. None of the services fail, uh, none of the services work as per our expectations. And uh, it's not only the front end services like websites, but I think we have to actually transform many of these services first and only then offer the, the front end access to the user. And maybe I think we have to take help of Tony in this context. He has already gifted a book to the world. Goa need to give an important role, as I said, to Tony to share and utilize his expertise for the benefit of Goa. I'm sure Tony will be more than happy to contribute to his state, though I know he's currently a globetrotter and is invited by top corporates to streamline their processes. Once again, I appeal you to read this book and I, I see already a lot of copies have gone through. Many thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about the book. I particularly thank Tony for the inspirational remark he wrote when he gifted the book to me during his last visit. He wrote to one of the most entrepreneurial and helpful people I know in Goa. So I don't know if I'm really helpful, but I think one should be helpful. But I was not aware that I have entrepreneurial skills and passion. Thank you, Tony, for discovering that. And I really look at things from a fresh perspective since I've read your book. I urge the audience once again to grab a copy and also recommend it to others. That is also more important. So that we can actually think of implementing some of these uh, uh, concepts in various organizations which we work or especially to the academics. You can also use it in a very different way. Once again, thank you for patient listening. I want to make just a couple of points here today. One is that you heard a lot about digital and technology, but this topic is not something for the IT organization. This topic is something that every one of you in each of your jobs, this affects you. And the second point I want to make to you is that Goa as a, a, a state and India as a country has a unique opportunity to take this digital transformation and win. And so this is why I believe digital transformation is important, as you can see from the slide there, to Goa. Now, um, in writing the book about five years ago, um, I talked to a hundred different CEOs, leaders of various companies, um, and I asked them, what does digital mean to you? And uh, so some of them, you know, like you heard from uh, uh, Ram Rao and others, talked about how, you know, artificial intelligence is going to transform uh, the entire world. And then there were others that said, oh no, it's okay, it's, it's all the stuff that IT, this, this IT function and PC support does, right? So maybe, Maybe they do it really, really badly. And this is really what I think they had in mind. Welcome to the Automated IT Support Center. Our menu has recently changed. Please listen to all the options before selecting. For email related issues, please press one. For printing related issues, please press two. For server related issues, please press three. For database related issues, please press four. 
internet related issues, please press 29. For website related issues, please press 30. You can now choose an option from our menu. In your own words, please describe the issue you are experiencing with printing. I'm unable to... Start speaking now. I'm unable to connect. Okay, so maybe the IT organizations are not quite as bad as that, but for many people, that's what digital is all about, right? And as I said, that is not what I want you to take away. What I want you to take away is how this is an important opportunity for every one of you here to actually be, uh, as, as, as Ram Rao had said earlier, a hero in the digital revolution. And in particular for Goa, because if low-cost blockchain technology, don't worry about the terms blockchain, but if low-cost technology can provide you Amazon-like experience where you can sell rooftop energy that you make, or if the same technology can help you solve forever this usual land records management issue in Goa, or if, if it can eliminate the middleman so you can help make a dent in poverty, that's a big deal. Or consider a few years now from now, if you can actually get a robot as a laborer for 150 rupees a week, and you pay for the whole year, but at the end of a year, that robot is free. What does that do to our economy? And these may seem like you know, futuristic um, uh, 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 challenges, but you know, consider this. There are 90% of articles, short articles on sports and uh, finance, that are made in the world today that are actually written not by journalists, but by robots. This is today. Okay? Or consider that in places like China and Latvia, um, my dear sister Ivy's profession is under attack because small claims courts are being handled by artificial intelligence, not judges. Okay? And by the way, these aren't the only industries because a few years from now, if medical diagnostics can be done through your smartphone on various um, uh, specific diseases, including AFib and, um, and um, uh, uh, genetic disorders, then the medical industry is going to get disrupted. And, and the reason why some of this is happening is because the cost of computers keeps dropping. I want to share with you a small video to illustrate that. Take a look at this. It's the world's smallest computer. Developed by the University of Michigan, the Micromote can fit on the edge of a nickel. Cubed, it's only one millimeter in size. Capable of taking pictures, reading temperatures, and recording pressure, the device is charged and programmed via light. So that was the University of Michigan's smallest computer in the world about four years ago. I had the extreme privilege of working with the next generation of that computer through IBM Labs. And that computer was one-tenth the size of this computer. That was not one millimeter, but 0.1 millimeter. 0.1 millimeter, by the way, is the thickness of a human hair. That small. And by the way, it's not just an IoT device. It's a fully functional computer of the capability of an IBM PC or an XT or AT of the 1990s. 0.1 millimeter. But that's not even the craziest thing. The craziest thing about the whole story is that the intended price of that is 70 paise. Imagine putting these 70 paise computers in every product that a company like Procter & Gamble makes, every bottle of shampoo. What would that do to your manufacturing and your transportation and your marketing and not just that, through waste management as the bottles end up in the landfill. What would happen? That's reality. And, and that's, not, that's not ignored because Wall Street and, and the Wall Street and others have recognized this and therefore five of the most valuable companies in the world, the top five are actually technology companies. And that does not even include Amazon and Alibaba, which arguably are also technology companies. Now, only eight years ago, there was only one on that list, Microsoft. And so, as you can see, technology is being rewarded, right? And it is rewarded because it is affecting every part of our lives. So, if fashion retailer Zara can design a dress 
and in two weeks it is sold everywhere in the world. How efficient does your manufacturing and distribution have to be for that to happen? Or if Chinese manufacturer Xiaomi can actually produce new batches of phones every week. I'm not talking about new software. You can do software upgrades 100 times a day, but new batches. What does that mean to research and development? Because typically research and development to create a phone might take a year or two. But these are research and development all the way from manufacturing done within a week. And this is why you hear you know, our prime minister say, we have to go digital because in a few years, 40% or 50% of manufacturing and transportation and many of these other uh, 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 industries will be disrupted by robots. That's why this is so important. And by the way, this is my favorite example. In five years there will be apps that will tell by your facial expression if you're lying. <laughs> so this is what's happening to the world around us. And the reason why that's happening is of this thing that some of you may be aware of, which is called Moore's Law, that says the price performance of computers doubles every 18 months, right? And, 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 and you know much of this, but let me point out a couple of things to you. If you look at 2023, for 70,000 rupees, you will be able to go out and buy the computing capacity of a human brain. Now, the human brain is a marvel of nature. And to be able to say, I can go buy that for 70,000 rupees, is pretty mad. But of course, it doesn't stop there. Because if you look at 2050, you will be able to buy for 70,000 rupees the computing capacity of all the brains on Earth. And I do a lot of work with Fortune 100 companies and their boards and CEOs. The number one issue that they worry about is what does my organization look like if I have to make the choice between computers and people, right? And the reason why all of this is happening is because we are in the middle of a revolution, an industrial revolution. So when I first heard about this about three or four years ago, I said, wait a minute, I remember going to school and, and learning about the industrial revolution. What do you mean fourth? What happened? You know, was I asleep for the second and the third? And as it turns out, no, I wasn't, or maybe I was, but the first one is the one that you all remember, you know, steam engines and, you know, um, other stuff, uh, the textile in the UK. The second one was the creation of electricity. The third one is the creation of the internet. And the fourth one is where one technology, digital, is eating all of the other technologies. So this one is different. It is not about one technology. It is about how that technology changes medical technology, and it changes mechanical technology, and it changes social technologies, because that's what Facebook is all about. So this is a different one, right? And then when people talk about digital disruption, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about how if you were a good retail Kirana store, and certainly your competition is you know, Flipkart somewhere, your entire business is gone. And not because you did something wrong, but you were perfectly set up to succeed in the third industrial revolution, but you are not successful in the fourth. That is called digital disruption. And digital transformation is the rewiring. So what do you do as a Kirana shop to change the way you operate so you are successful in the fourth industrial revolution? That is simply what digital transformation is. Right? And, and I learned that, as, Surya, uh, as, um, as uh, Ramra was saying, uh, four years ago at Procter & Gamble when I was talking to these hundred different CEOs and, and this is an email chain from uh, my exchange with the CEO of a company saying, hey, um, you know, let's get together and meet. And he said, yes. And I said, I'm not available next week. On, this was the April 10th. And he said, fine, I will ask Amy, who I assumed was the secretary, to set it up. And then his secretary basically sends my secretary this message saying, happy to do something, does Monday, April 20th work, so on and so forth. And, and I apologize because the screen is a little, um, uh, the, the word is a little small. But I want to point out a few things. When I say on April 10th, I'm not available next week, none of the options that are generated by, you guessed it, Amy was a robot, none of those options were the following week. Again, this was 2015. And then you ask yourself, which is one of the most sensitive roles in a company? 
it is probably the secretary of a CEO. And for that to be done by a robot in 2015, that tells you that technology exists to do stuff like that. Right? And that's why, you know, I, that's when I really started to think about how can we make this happen? And then I led a, an organization at PNG to help us do that. And that's what brings us today. And, and, and back to my key message is that digital transformation is not about IT. Digital transformation is about how each of you, if you're a teacher, you have to, you don't have to become a programmer, but you have to understand how IT will disrupt your area, which is teaching, and medicine, and, and so on and so forth. And so I thought I'd kind of end by sharing what I believe Goa needs to do in the context of this. And the first thing we need to do is every industry that's important to Goa, starting with um, the Honorable Minister's industries here um, that are so important, science and technology, waste management, you know, and, 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 and Commodore Nagpal's shipbuilding and education uh, from the Vice Chancellor, and then agriculture, mining, tourism, all absolutely need to have a plan because those industries are the lifeblood of Goa, right? The second is industry leaders, business owners, need to understand how to leapfrog on digital technology, and I will come back to that later. And you have to experiment. The only way to learn this, you're not gonna learn this all the time, is get started, make mistakes, and then keep learning, right? And then whether you're a lay person or a leader, you have to educate yourself on these technologies. But most importantly, I highlighted in yellow that I strongly believe that this is an opportunity of historic proportions for Goa and India. And here's why I believe this. If you look at history, the first, second, third industrial revolutions, the business leaders that became really rich at the end of that weren't good at technology. They had only two characteristics. They were open to change, and they had the risk-taking ability to try something. So you do not need individually to be programmers. You have to be open to change. And why do I believe Goa in particular, or India, is, is you know, poised to win? And it's, it's simply this. When you look at the world, when you talk to a Google or a Facebook or an Amazon, most of their software development comes from India. Goa, uh, India is the software factory for the, India is the fa software factory for the whole world. India also has people that are probably the most eager to learn and the most change acceptable people. That's us, that's who we are. And so I think this is an opportunity. And, and really, the book is an attempt to say, you have to grab the opportunity, but be aware that 70% of these things fail. And so here are a few checklists to become successful, right? So it's as really as simple as that. And I honestly believe that we can all be successful. I honestly believe this is a historic opportunity for us to be successful. Because if calendaring can be done by a robot, if you can have, you know, judging small claims courts be done by robots, or, you know, if you can basically have comedy be done by robots, smart, hungry people that are open to change, like you and I here, can certainly be very, very, be very, very successful in this industrial revolution. And by the way, I wasn't joking about comedy being done by robots. I wanted to end by showing you how comedy can be done by robots. Here you go. Lowbot is amazing at riffing as well, so like this is a really great opportunity. So if anyone's got any topics, just yell them out. Well, yes. Yes. well okay, I heard global, global warming. I have been programmed to operate in temperatures in excess of 90 degrees Celsius. The two guys are <laughs> Lowbot uses stochastic modeling to pull data from this enormous library of content that's available to you thousands of hours of shows and it uses deep learning algorithms to, to tease out the meaning from those comedy shows and try and generate new jokes. See me, Lowbot, at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Death to all humans. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Thank you very much. I was quite fascinated uh, by reading Tony's book. In fact, uh, he presented the, this book during his last visit. <clears throat>
you know, uh, a few years, uh, I think it was sometimes in December last year, uh, government had uh, told us, in fact, uh, to spend some part of our turnover on digitization, artificial intelligence, IoT, and start working on these projects. The first thing was, you know, uh, since we are from the shipbuilding industry, and uh, the first question was, what is this in artificial intelligence? When you are used to day-to-day -day work, how this IoT and what is this coming in our way and will be able to meet this target or not? We have certain memorandum of understanding with the government that we will do this, 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 end of the year. So, we started searching, what is this? Generally, I ring a flurry when, you know, uh, leaves in my garden becomes yellow. <laughs> or, you know, sometimes I see some insects, I've eaten some leaves. I'll ring a flurry and say something is wrong with these leaves or there's some problem. Uh, then she would tell me how to, you know, get this corrected, put neem oil and, you know, some kind of organic insecticides. And so this time, of course, uh, I came to know that her brother is an artificial intelligence expert in United States and I requested her if I could have a video call and to understand what is this artificial intelligence and if it could help us in you know getting through it. It so happened and um, uh, Mr. Tony was very kind and we had uh, two rounds of video conferences to understand what is this artificial intelligence. In fact uh, when Ramarao said that uh, we must use expertise of uh, you know, Mr. Tony in Goa, I was thinking I was the first one to, you know, start using this expertise. And uh, uh, we actually uh, went detail into a uh, couple of projects on artificial intelligence. One of uh, that was uh, conditioning monitoring of uh, marine engines on board offshore petrol vessels that we make. Another was, of course, they were very small projects and with his support, we have been able to place order on one of the firms to do this work for us. Uh, when I went through this book, that was part of the uh, story which, uh, or part of the thing where we took uh, Tony's help and uh, thank you very much, sir, for this great help and assistance that you gave us. And uh, in fact, we sent our uh, requirements to him, statement of requirement, which we generally follow before tendering out to see if what needs to be added. Uh, his book rightly says that, uh, you know, what we actually feel IT, IT is different from digitization, IT is different from artificial intelligence. And we actually used to three, uh, see in our systems when we have ERP or SAP system, our process of financing, accounting, HR, design, they get covered in the SAP or ERP systems, most of these. But when we went, uh, you know, through this artificial intelligence, when I read his book, is much beyond that. That is when actually process start learning and starts helping you to solve your own problems couple of instances, we used to take a lot of time, then I thought, why not to use this artificial intelligence model in our shipyard in a very, very, rather than thinking of big ERPs, employing uh, huge consultants and try to offload or subcontract the job generally, uh, there is a tendency when you see a program too big, the best thing you find is let us subcontract this job to a consultant and let him work out what is the requirement our company needs. So he comes and interviews every one of us. You tell us what is the gap analysis, what do you do, what do you want? And then finally he tells us how you should work and he frames the requirement. But probably uh, what Tony's book says is, you know, it's essential uh, that a leader must understand very clearly. And the time is that leader has to understand digitization much deeper than using the consultants and outsourcing the job. So taking a clue, I mean, when I read this book, we thought why not to apply these small, small 
rather than hiring big consultant for big systems. Why not to apply these, you know, into small, small work that we do. Medical bills takes time. If we can reduce that three months of medical bill to a man to ten days, five days, two days, three days, you will feel very happy. A man coming from 20 kilometers for a bill to Goa shipyard for 500 rupees medical bill to be cleared, spending so much, can we reduce the time? In fact, we did a couple of experiments and I am very happy to say that we have been able to drastically, in fact some of the employees are here and I am sure they would have finally, they would have found the system much, much better. We are now getting into more and more, uh, you know, each employee going to HR department to ask what is my basic pay, how many leave are left. Now I am only taking basic examples of, uh, you know, can we convert into a system like a robot keeps on answering that, okay, your 10 days are left, this is your pay, your increment due is on such and such date. There are cases where the safety in a workshop, someone is not putting a helmet, can someone, he gets a message on his mobile, uh, you are not putting helmet, please put on your helmet, if he still doesn't put, there is an announcement in the shop, if he does, still doesn't put, the machine doesn't work until he does take very good precautions. Uh, facial recognition to, and use of artificial intelligence we have been trying to use. Uh, in fact, uh, this book actually uh, came to me at the right time when I was trying to implement some of these minor changes and these minor changes affect the organization quite a bit. Uh, so I am thankful to you, Tony, and uh, I am definitely uh, I'm sure when next time during your next visit you have time and uh, please visit our organization and we'll continue to interact with you and um, uh, I think it's, it's a great uh, it's a great read I, I would uh, request you to kindly read it's a beautiful book thanks Minister for Ports DRDA Science and Technology and Waste Management of the Government of Goa Sri Michael Lobo the star of this afternoon Sri Tony Saldana Commodore B.B. Nagpal, Nausena Medal, Chairman and Managing Director, Goa Shipyard Limited, Sri Ram Rao Surya Vag, Associate Professor, Goa Business School, and Director, Digital Learning and Initiatives, Goa University, and distinguished audience. A very good evening to all of you. This is really, uh, in many ways, an outstanding book. But before I tell you why I think it's outstanding, let me tell you what it's not. This is not a book that's been written by someone who wants to write a book. You know, there are lots and lots of books that are written by people who want to write a book. Uh, that this is not that type of a book. This is a book written by someone who really has something to say, who really has something to contribute, and who's therefore taken huge chunks of time out of what is an extremely busy uh, professional life to, to write this book. So, you know, we use the term labor of love very casually, but this really in that sense is a labor of love. It's a book written, and this is clear to anybody who reads this book, uh, by someone who's, who's really been in the trenches, who's actually seen this up close, and who really believes that he has an experience that's worth sharing. So it's also, in a very real sense, an act of immense intellectual generosity. Because it's, it's actually saying, look, this is what I've learned. And this is what I think my experience can possibly help you with when you go along the same journey.
It's Pilgrim's Progress in that sense. Right? And that's really wonderful. There are very few books really these days written in that spirit. Um, and that shines through in this book. You know, it really comes through. Uh, and the other thing this book is not, is that it's not a typical book in management studies. Because a typical book in management studies is all about coining at least three new bits of jargon. Uh, preferably alliterative. Uh, there's some of that in this book too, but <laughs> Tony couldn't have spent a lifetime in that field without being at least partly infected by it. Uh, so there are things that could have been perhaps said, said simpler than they have been said, have been written. But that's really not. Normally when I sort of wade my way through books and management, and I have to given the job I do, I sort of do that kind of stuff, um, I just keep wondering and saying, you know, you know, this whole paragraph I could summarize. That could be a pressy and literally, you know, a sentence of ten words. You can sum up what this whole paragraph is about. But this is not that type of a book at all. Um, it's a really carefully crafted book. It's a really carefully crafted book. So, you know, you can flip through it and read a bit here and a bit there, but it's not really going to fundamentally benefit you. So this is a book that, if you take it up, you really do have to start at your beginning and work your way to the end. Because it all fits. These are all interlocking pieces. And so, you know, there may be something interesting on page 47. Uh, but, you know, I would, in this, in this era in which we live, where we all lack, you know, those qualities of patience that made our ancestors do great things, um, you know, I think this is also a book where you really need to have that staying power in the sense of starting at the beginning. It's an easy book to read, so don't make, I don't want to make it sound as if this is a book you'll have to struggle through. On the contrary, it's, it's an easy book to read. But it is a book which really deserves to be read from page one and read all the way through. Uh, you know, so that, that thing which we knew when we were kids, which I suppose the younger generation does not know, which is called the bookmark is, I think, very needed in this book. So if you've got to stop at a certain point, bookmark it, put it aside, and start reading it again from that point. Maybe going back a page or two to pick up the threads again. So what does this book do? I'm not from information technology. I'm not from management studies. Uh, so I want to sort of say that up front. I, am, I come from very, very different fields. But what this book really does, is it tells us we need to understand the persistent reasons for failure. Why, why we fail at certain activities more often than we succeed. And of all of those activities in which as society we fail, as organizations we fail, positive transformation in the face of pressures that force us to transform the chances are that unless we do things in a particular type of way, we are probably not going to succeed. Because the stimulus for change is coming from outside. We are responding to certain circumstances. We all know what happens to an organism that does not, that does not adapt to its ecosystem. It perishes. So when those ecosystemic pressures build upon us as individuals, as families, as communities, as organizations, as nations, we have to understand what those external stimuli are, those external challenges are, and adapt. Or in some very fundamental sense, we are going to perish. And I think this book helps us understand that. It helps us understand that in the context of digital transformation, but it contextualizes it historically. It sort of locates it in previous examples of the Industrial Revolution at different stages and how you could have been a very successful player in one technological era and completely failed when it comes to another technological era. Think of Kodak. I mean, you know, Kodak was that iconic brand. Today, I mean, you know, somebody, somebody sort of in, 
you know, in their 15 to 18 years old out here may not have heard of Kodak. I mean, it's so amazing. I mean, we were young. There were only two films. There was Kodak or Fuji. You could choose one of the two, and that was it. Uh, and it was a bit like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, you know, I mean, which, of course, for a long time we didn't have in our country, but when it came back. So it was like that. And today, Kodak doesn't exist. So you've got those examples, but then you also have examples, very interesting ones, of, of companies that presumably made the change and yet were not able to sort of, you know, pull through eventually. So companies that were leaders in one technological era became also ran in another technological era, which tells us that just because we are good at what we do today, there's no guarantee that we'll be good in the face of the pressures of tomorrow. And, and we, we need to understand that, and that I think also brings upon us all individually and collectively a certain modicum of humility. And also sort of, I believe, as somebody who's in the education field, makes us hopefully understand that we are always learners. And then we stop learning when we lose the capacity to unlearn and we do not have the fortitude to relearn, we are going to essentially become in some ways redundant. Most of the people of a particular age in this room know that every time they face a particular type of device and they find that their grandkids, you know, who are eight years old are, are able to sort of adapt to that device in a way that they simply cannot. But that's precisely about this process of not just being able to learn, but also being able to unlearn and relearn. And that's not easy. And the older you get, in fact, the tougher it gets. If it's true for us as human beings, it's also true for us as organizations. That's the point to remember. And as organizations, we keep banging on about the need to be innovative. But let's also accept an organization is a social institution. And a social institution implies tradition. And tradition is as important to any organization's DNA as innovation is. And it's that equipoise between innovation and tradition that actually sort of leads to organizational existence. And it becomes extremely difficult at moments of transformation. What do you jettison? What do you throw out? What do you keep? What is essentially you without which you will no longer be you? And what is it that you imagine is you but it's not really you? So you can actually now you know, dump it overboard. Naval officers know this very well. When a vessel is in very stormy conditions, you sometimes have to start throw things overboard. What do you throw overboard? What do you keep? What is essential? What is not? So, so, so these are sort of some of the, the real challenges. And I think this book just brings it out beautifully. It sort of, it sort of points out to us one of the things I, which I realized I didn't have clarity on till I read the book, that exponential technology and exponential organizations are not one and the same thing. Because I sort of always had this kind of lazy understanding that an exponential organization is an organization that uses exponential technologies. And then, of course, it's not that. An exponential organization is an organization that is able to use exponential technologies in order to be able to get an order of magnitude better at what it is doing. So it's a kind of a 10x, 10 times. You've got, but that's kind of the, you know, the yardstick. So you know, if you're going to be using exponential technologies, it's not just for the sake of using them. It's not just for the sake of survival, but it's to actually be able to increase your output, get, or whatever it may be, the metric may be 10 times by an order of magnitude. Now, when I read this book, I, I sort of wondered what it means for the field of education. Because Tony, you're, you're in a world which is accustomed to organizations dying. So the corporate sector is a sector in which, you know, organizations either are able to withstand competitive pressure, changing consumer tastes, shifts in technology, whole range of those factors, and come out winners, or they will inevitably perish. I come, I work in a sector where organizations never die. There's a fundamental difference between the corporate world and the education world is that. A university lasts forever. 
you know, you may not like the fact. <laughs> Goa University is, I know, the softest target in the state of Goa. Uh, you know, anything wrong with Goa, dump it on the university. You know, because we don't respond, because we are a, we are a house of learning, so we we behave with decorum, even if nobody else does. Uh, and, you know, so dump it all on the university. But the fact is, we are going to exist when nobody else in this room exists. Goa University is still going to be around. Goa University is going to be around 350 years from now. 451 years from now. <laughs> we will outlast the Portuguese. <laughs> we, will. we will. We will. It's the nature of the university. It's a very unique type of social organization. But this is the point. If you're not willing to understand what those external challenges are, and if you're not able to transform, what will happen to you as a university is you will no longer be able to fulfill your social purpose. So you will continue to exist. Universities will continue to exist. Colleges will continue to exist. Mention was made in this wonderful introduction that, uh, that you crafted for me about my, my being one of the three authors of Technology Vision 2035 for the government of India. And then on education sector, there's a sentence we wrote, which was the following, and I remember it textually. It is that schools, colleges, and universities, as currently constituted, will be redundant by 2035. It's there, it's there in a document of the government of India, right? I wrote it, so I know it's there, <laughs> right? Now you would say, Believe me, we spent about six hours thinking about this statement and the word redundant. Do we really mean redundant? Do we mean something else? And at the end of six hours, we came to the conclusion that no, the word we are talking about is redundant. Which doesn't mean that schools will stop existing or colleges or universities will stop existing. But the purpose for which we are created, which is the production and transmission of knowledge and the associated skills, we will no longer be performing that function if we do not adapt. And therefore, I think that the job of someone like uh, my dear friend and colleague Ram Rao is very, very serious. You know, when, he'd say, when, I, when we say that he's director of digital learning and initiatives, it is, in fact, today one of the most critical portfolios in Goa University. Uh, he has the responsibility of actually looking at the entire university, university as a whole, not one particular school or department, but the university as a whole. Um, and sort of really asking those key questions. You know, what is, what is it when we... When we face this, this digital world, this world where, as I tell my, as I go around my colleges, I, I say this to teachers, that we live in a technological era where just a few years from now, could be as soon as five years, certainly not more than 15 years, and this is one of the examples I give. The learner in Vasco, with headsets on, would be able to hear in real time in Konkani, a lecture being delivered in organic chemistry, in German, in Heidelberg. We are somewhere between 5 to 15 years away from that. That's the reality. Now, if you don't, anybody in this room who's a teacher who doesn't understand this reality. So, so it's not just about being a good teacher of organic chemistry. It's being as good as this guy in Heidelberg whose lectures are so good that people in other countries who don't speak German are willing to, you know, listen to that lecture. That's going to be the challenge. Are we up to it? Do we even begin to understand what that's going to do? The classroom will still be there. The teacher will still walk into the classroom and still deliver the lecture in organic chemistry. The students will not be really listening to the teacher at all. They'll all be looking at their smartphones and doing something else. What are you doing? No, I'm taking notes, ma'am. I'm taking notes, ma'am. But, but, you know, we all know what they're doing otherwise. Because they've already heard the lecture. And they already understand that topic better than what is being explained to them in the class. That's the challenge. It's an existential challenge in a way. And as I was reading this book, this kept coming back to me over and over again. So when you say, you know, that uh, we, we, we should sort of find ways in which we could uh, you know, request Tony to contribute to Goa, I think that's right, but a subset of that to the entire education space in Goa, to sort of get some ideas about some of these key issues, I think is going to be fundamental. One of the things which after I read the book, I mean, 
you know, it's, it's, it's never good to only say good things about a book. You, re you agree with that, right? So, I mean, so let, me, let, me, let me sort of raise a couple of issues where, where I have concerns. I mean, not concerns, but these are the real thoughts were triggered. Um, and I ended up having less than clarity on this. One is that, you know, the, your argument, the Atul Gawande argument about checklists is perfectly correct. But I wonder whether it is to some extent sectoral. And what I mean by that is there's, there's an equally convincing argument given by folks like Tim Harford about trial and error. You know, and you yourself in your book say in the initial phase, a lot of what you did was trial and error. And we know that there are major areas where, in fact, trial and error is the way we proceed, drug discovery. The entire area of drug discovery is trial and error. It cannot be about checklists. Checklists come in, but it's really trial and error. So I was, I was reading the book. I, I mean, I kept having this thing that, you know, checklists. And the checklist you have, by the way, in Appendix B, if I remember correctly, of this book is B, right? Yes. It's, it's really a great checklist, uh, you know. Uh, but, but I wondered some stage when you sort of think about this more the next time you want to write, Maybe if you could sort of, you know, from your vantage point, explore this, this, this relationship, the relationship between checklists on the one hand and sort of trial and error. Because it seems to me on the face of it that these are really two radically different ways to approach a problem. And, 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 and are there some problems that are more, more sort of amenable to checklists and other problems that are more amenable to trial and error? So that would be something that I would just lay out there for you. Um, the second sort of thought I had as I read through this is that the fourth industrial revolution, as we know, is already sort of morphing into the fifth industrial revolution. And I mean by that the industrial revolution concerning the biosciences more broadly, but fundamentally the cognitive sciences, the sciences of complexity. And to some extent, you know, when you, when you think, and, and you say this so categorically in your book, that you know, the fourth industrial revolution is the digital transformation. These are almost synonymous terms, right? So, so I wonder, sort of, you know, the fifth industrial revolution, uh, you know, which would obviously be based on, on, on the substrate of the fourth industrial revolution, um, would, would this, your broad postulates, hold for that as well? So, and I suspect that among the organizations that you consult with are organizations very much in the biosciences space. Uh, so so it would be great to sort of at some stage get some sense from you on that. Uh, and the third thing, and I'll end at this point, uh, I've only spoken a bit more than I'd intended to. Um, you know, the longer I've been a social scientist, I've come to the conclusion that there are fundamentally two impediments to change. And those two impediments have never really shifted. And those impediments are nature and culture. So, you know, ultimately, to actually have positive, purposive change. We've got, we need to work with nature and culture rather than against the grain. You know, so, so, so if, we, if, we, if we sort of go against nature or we go against culture, ultimately we will not succeed. And sort of, there were hints of this throughout your book, but I, don't, I didn't get a feeling that you had looked at it from, from that perspective. There's no reason why you should have. You, you, your, your book, as I said, is very, very beautifully crafted and from a different perspective. Basically, you know, the subtitle of this book is really important. How to take off and stay ahead. And I think the really important point is in the five stages as Tony lays it out. The first four stages are all stages about takeoff. Will you even be able to take off uh, in the area of transformation? But the fifth stage is what he calls very evocatively uh, for the bioscientists in the room, uh, is the living DNA. And he says that if you're, going to, if you're going to stay ahead, it's going to be because this becomes a part of the DNA of the organization itself. Uh, and I, I thought that was just wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, a bit of a mixed metaphor, but I think it's, it, 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 it works beautifully. It works beautifully. So, so I, think, I think this is really important because a lot of us think of it just as being about takeoff. You take off and you've reached escape velocity. But I think, I think the point that he makes continuously in the book is that taking off is not enough. And in fact, accidents happen after you take off and don't stay, stay up. You know, I mean, accidents don't happen if you're not able to take off. You stay on the ground. So, so, so you know, aviation disasters happen when you take off, but for some reason are not able to stay aloft. Uh, and I thought, I thought that was also very wonderful. 
thanks for having included me in this uh, in this event. Um, I'm deeply honored, and I also now own two copies of this book, which is, <laughs> which is a bonus. Thanks a lot. Dignitaries on the dais, Shri Professor Dr. Varunji, Komodor Nagpalji, Shri Ramarao Desai, uh, Vakji, and our uh, hero of the of this evening, that is uh, our very own Govan. Tony Saldana. Digital transformation fail. I think a lot have been explained by our dignitaries, professor, and especially Mr. Dr. Varun. He has explained to us, to us everything. And I think when we speak about digital, we one immediate thought which what we get is uh, our Prime Minister Narendra Ji Modi in 2014, his first speech of, of Digital India. And he's, when he speaks about Digital India, 130 crore population, well, with a click of a button, he says that you will get things. And there we go on. And I think Goa, when we speak about digital, we have so many uh, departments of government of Goa and uh, new new consultants come in. I think there are some government officers over here. They will agree with me. Good new consultants come in. They give us long presentations. Uh, now I am handling waste management. They give me so many different presentations. And actually the basic things what is required on day-to-day -day basis, you go to a collector's office for a simple certificate. This he will give you give it to you on your on your mobile or on your on your mail. He'll send it to you on mail, but practically it doesn't come. They say we have sent, but it doesn't come. So we it has failed. But we cannot say that let us stop this. This is, this is the basic things I'm talking about, the Goan people, what we are facing at the smallest level. So the children who are computer savvy, like the digital, the, they go, they want to ask online. But here we are having so many different types of problems in Goa. First of all, uh, our, uh, they say servers are down and they say there is no network. And then we see even from the young kids to the elders going for a signal like this. They take the mobile like this, they go like this. From this end to that end. So we are just coming up. India is just, uh, it is just coming out from the shell of, of this digital. Uh, but definitely you are an asset to the world and we require your help. We require your help, not only in Goa, I think uh, Narendra Ji Modi, our Honorable Prime Minister, will definitely invite him uh, at his uh, official place to discuss with you because he is very, um, he wants India to go digital in every way, not only in, in, uh, in, in the defense sector, but in every way. I still remember um, our ex uh, Chief Minister Manohar Chipparika, when I met him first in 2004, I used to meet him earlier than that, but when I met him first as a, uh, to discuss about Parra village, so he reminded me of uh, our watermelon, he's got a watermelon story of Parra, Parra watermelons are famous in Goa, and he asked me, how tumchi karna koshiya ha? So I used to eat watermelons in my young days. So I am like, karna ha, ta pun title log rai na. Aad mare maka ek, means bring for me one. So next day I go early in the morning with the watermelon for him at his house. So the watermelon was only so big. Earlier he used to eat so big watermelon. So I see what happened to this watermelon? I said, this is the only watermelon which is available now. He said, um, maybe the, the good seed, is not there now. Can you revive this? He said, 
how do I revive this? I asked him. So I went back to the farmers. I called a small meeting. Arey Baba, I said, this car is here. The doctor is here. He said, this is a big deal. He said, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. He said, this is a big deal. So, Parikar Ji, when I met him again, he said, revive it, go to a good company. So, you use technology. So, I, we took help from Syngenta. And today, if you see our watermelons back again, they are such big ones. And those real taste of those days. So, it took for them uh, nearly one long year to revive our watermelons. And I think that uh, we need to preserve all these old traditions of Aza there and culture, like our professor has said. And these are, this is one thing which Manoharji said that this is, this is your identity. Para means watermelon. Like that we have in every village. Like we have different things like chilies. I think chilies are very famous in the Madam stays, our Madam Kerka stays. Chilies are very famous over there. And now you don't see those chilies anymore. I think we re require uh, technology to revive all these things and back again those seeds. Those seeds are still there and people are still growing. Maybe two, three farmers are growing, but you will find so small chili. Earlier they were so big, very spicy, very tasty. Now the things are, those things have gone, but we can still revive them. But we require help, likewise I told you. Like we have so many consultants coming in, promising us uh, very big things. But when they deliver, they just give it to us, they sign and they are gone. And our offices suffer. We say we are digital on paper, but in reality it is not true. And all the government offices, uh, we, we have a lot of problems in every department when it comes to digitalizations. We have, there are various problems, various issues and failures. But definitely, if you train, if you train some youth in Goa who are, who are good in digital world, definitely they can help us. And there are good consultants also in Goa. So if we can get your expertise to our uh, youth of Goa who are... Uh, small consultants in Goa who can help the government offices revive our digital uh, technology, then we will get the real help instead of we government spending thousands of rupees, lakhs of rupees to adopt something. Uh, they give us something and they just go away. It, it really does not work. And I think definitely science and technology we have adopted new technologies. We are treating waste. We, uh, we, we uh, treat, treat waste to energy. I think some uh, Navin Times reporter is over here. He accompanied us uh, to see all this, how waste is being treated into, into uh, energy. We went to three countries, officially from Goa. That was the first revolution which took place as far as waste is concerned. And science and technology, our department uh, also added the, the main uh, word called waste in science and technology. And we started treating waste for the first very time in, in Goa, in our constituency of Kalangut. I don't know whether you have come to our uh, our uh, uh, place where 120,000 square meter has been uh, acquired by the government and we have built a state-of-the-art treatment facility. I would request you to come with us and see this uh, facility in your very own village, uh, Saligaon. Saligaon and Kalangut, but it is in Kalangut, but the entry is from Saligaon. So definitely Goa is growing in every direction. like. Uh, it's a tourist destination, but digital transformations are required and is the need of the hour. And this can be used not only privately, we can 
we 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 want it the government wants it but we are lagging behind on in various fields so we request your help like everybody said and i thank you especially that you have you being a goan origin and a, a heart and everything from goa that you have you have uh, released your book over here and this will help the youth the youth who wants to make your uh, take your ideas and transform goa and india i thank you once again for inviting me and especially the our teacher uh, mrs wals uh, and giving me this opportunity to speak god bless and definitely we will make use of your ideas and we want you to be part of a uh, transformation of uh, digital uh, uh, transformation of of all the government uh, sectors in goa especially all the offices thank you so the book is why digital transformations fail as you all know digital is one of the biggest priorities for india and it's also the number one priority for the world's biggest leaders and the world's biggest countries and most important countries and i am absolutely delighted to have uh, the book released here in my hometown uh, of goa because i think goa has a unique opportunity to leapfrog many of the problems that we have by using digital as a technology uh, the book is why digital transformations fail Uh, but really it is a how to checklist guide on how digital transformation can become successful so although globally about 70% of um digital transformations fail it doesn't have to be that bad if you follow a disciplined checklist so i just wanted to say um it is a real pleasure to actually have uh the, the minister for uh, science and technology uh, shri michael lobo um to have the honorable vice chancellor um uh, professor varun sani to have uh, the chairman and managing director of um goa shipyard uh, commodore um uh, nakpal and to also have my dear friend uh, associate professor um uh, 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 professor uh, associate professor ram rao uh, bog uh, to be here and of course um all of the wonderful people that were able to join us thank you very much Thank you.